Hello everybody, it's Jade. Once again, I'm going to apologize for the loud noises you're probably going to hear in the background of this episode. Again, I don't live here alone. This video covers chapters 5.5 through 6.5 of Pact by Wild Vo. Um, so 5.5 starts out and Blake is sitting on a bench on the side of the road with Evan waiting for Rose and Fel to come pick them up. After a dramatic series of small arguments between Blake and Rose, they decide to go pursue the abstract demon and at least and at least put in a token effort of trying to defeat it before midnight. So the abstract demon was the demon that apparent that has apparently been eating members of the Knights of the Basement. The Knights of the Basement have apparently been losing members, but they don't remember them. They just realize that they used to be a bigger team. Some of the data that they have about their past suggests that they used to be much stronger and much more powerful. So there's almost nothing that they can know about the Abstract Demon when they go fight it. Um, but they did promise Conquest that they would go try. And, um, and so they do. On the way there, Blake and Rose talk about how they see magic. And, um, and Blake says that he sees magic as art something that you feel. But Rose doesn't quite argue, but she says that she sees it as science, and she always finds herself looking for the underlying logic underneath whatever they're doing. Blake is depicted sort of as being more in the right, because he's the one who has done more magic, even though she has read more about it. Um, but it, I don't think that Blake is 100% right, that it's all about how you feel and stuff like that, um, there, there is an internal consistency to it. And on that note, I'm, I'm definitely more like Rose. I keep looking for an internal logic to it. And when Blake is coming up with these abstract conceptual ideas for how something probably will work, I honestly have a hard time judging whether his ideas are good or bad. Normally, if Blake thinks something is going to work, I think it's not going to work, especially with, um, with some of the ideas presented here like, like fire being used to fight memory loss. Like I totally didn't think that was going to work. So on that note, I've prepared a bit of a presentation for how I think Blake and Rose should be defeating the abstract demon. Hello kids, welcome to science class. It's your teacher, Jade, and today we're going to learn how to defeat the abstract demon. So the first bit of this explanation is going to include a little bit of spoilers for Worm Up to Arc 10. So, I'm going to put a timestamp in the description of where you can skip to if you want to have absolutely no spoilers. But, for now, I don't think this one's a big deal. We're going to be talking about somebody from Worm who deals with memory, like the Abstract Demon does. So, in Worm, Aisha has the ability to block herself and anything she's doing from the memories of everyone else, so it's completely impossible to comprehend what she's doing or where she is at any time. No matter how far away you are from her, or how much you care about her, you can't remember her if she doesn't want you to. So we're going to use her as an example for the concept of abstraction. How far away do we need to get from a memory blocking effect in order to be able to comprehend the problem that we're dealing with? So in Worm, there's the example of Aisha tying a rope around someone's neck. When, when she does so, the person who has their neck tied is incapable of thinking about the fact that there's a rope around their neck, but they are able to comprehend that they can't breathe. So, we've got these four steps. Aisha, the thing she's doing, the effect that that has on a person, and that person. So which of these steps is the person able to comprehend? These two. Each person is able to comprehend the effect that the action has on them, but not what Aisha is directly doing, or her herself. I have a question. How does this work with additional steps? What happens if there are extra steps between here and here? I have a theory. It is my understanding that no matter how many steps go between Aisha and you, you can only not comprehend Aisha and what she's doing. But anything beyond that step, you are completely capable of understanding and remembering. So, the abstract demon, in fact, appears to operate on very similar principles, although it does seem to be more powerful. So if we want to be able to get around the limitations that are imposed by this creature. We have to approach it with a similar logic. So my proposed solution is to build a robot. 
we don't have terribly many concrete stories of what the abstract demon can and cannot do, because everyone that comes into contact with it is completely forgotten. We do have one concrete example, though, and that is the graffiti that Blake sees when he enters the factory where the abstract demon is. So we can assume that those graffiti artists were eaten by the abstract demon. So we can create a similar chart to what we did with Aisha. The demon eats the graffiti artists, but their graffiti remains. And Blake is able to see this. So what is Blake able to comprehend? The exact same square we had previously. Only Ur and the thing that actually comes into contact with her is obscured. It appeared when Blake was talking to the Knights of the Basement that perhaps the property and personal effects of the people who had been eaten had been eaten as well. But we can see by the fact that the graffiti was left that that is not the case. So there are two concepts we need to build into our robot as much as possible. Abstraction and redundancy. We need to get as many layers away from your as possible. But we also need to make sure that any data we are able to find is backed up so that we can not only find it later, but find it if someone disappears who had access to it. So what requirements does our robot have? First, it must be able to drive autonomously. If a person is looking through the robot's cameras to be able to drive it, they are placing themselves in danger, as far as we know from chapter 5.5. The next requirement our robot has is that it must be able to test offensive and defensive measures and return feedback about those measures to its human in the likely event that something happens to the robot. Next, we're not actually building one robot. We are building like eight. Each measurement taken by the robot has to be connected to its own wireless card and backed up to a separate server so that if the abstract demon affects only sight but not hearing, we are able to get the sound data even if we lose the camera data. Finally, once we've backed all this data up to a server, each server must again back up that data after encrypting it or decoding it in some way so that there is an additional step of processing between one server and the next. Hopefully, we're able to repeat this process as many times as possible so that we get as many server backups in as many different forms as we possibly can. So the primary defensive measure that the robot would need to be testing is circles. Blake, like every other practitioner, primarily uses circles as his method of self-defense. So if Blake were to go into the factory after using this robot, he would need to know which circles were most he would need to know which circles were most effective against the demon. So, in order to test this, you would place a you would place the circles around the robot concentrically, with what you expect to be the least effective farthest away from the robot, and what you expect to be most effective closest. Then, each layer of the circle would have a sensor on it that would report back to a separate server so that if an outer layer gets eaten, we'll forget about it. But we will remember that an inner layer is remembered. In this case, the circles in the diagram are the wreath of greenery, the fire, and the like, in order of least effective to most. Finally, the data from each of the sensors has to be backed up into a separate server, as I mentioned previously. So the map, any maps that are created have to be backed up to a server. Any weapons that are tested, the feedback from those has to be backed up to a server. All the circles that are tested, the feedback from those has to be backed up to a server, as well as any infrared, camera, or LiDAR data, data gathered. And that's how you defeat the abstract demon with science. So after coming up with a couple of half-assed plans, and apparently some good plans that don't really go anywhere, um, Blake and Rose decide to go into the factory, and, and Fel leaves them there. Both Blake and Rose talk to Evan about what they do and do not expect him to do during this mission. Um, Namely, they don't want him to go inside, but they do want him to scout. Um, and it's interesting to watch the differences in how Blake and Rose treat Evan. They both seem to have a similar level of comfort around children, but they deal with him in slightly different ways. And this is the one thing so far that I've been able to point at and say, I think this is actually a gender difference. Um, culturally, I think that Rose would be more likely to emulate her mother than than Blake would be, especially if Blake doesn't want to emulate either of his parents. So yeah, it's inter that's definitely interesting to watch. The main difference, and we've only seen Evan and Rose interact a little bit, appears to be that Rose talks down to Evan and Blake dumbs down his speech for Evan. He explains concepts in a simpler way and Rose seems to 
talk to him more like he's a child. She doesn't appear to disrespect him, but but in her speech, she's not trying to get down to his level as much as Blake is. So, so 5.6 actually has a really cool almost fight scene, but not quite, between Blake, Rose, Evan, and the abstract demon. Um, I'm not going to get into it too much, because I, from what I understand, this fight has been picked to death. But it's a really cool and interesting fight. I did have a lot of trouble really parsing it at first, because you're only getting hints that something is gone after it's gone. Before an object or a person gets eaten, there's no mention of them. Um, so the first time I read this, I, I did have a little bit of difficulty parsing it. Um, but overall, it's a really cool fight. Especially because Blake is completely incapable of really accomplishing anything other than gathering data. And even that he can't really do since he can't look at the creature. It's kind of adorable that Evan is repeatedly told by Blake and Rose to stay away, but he's always looking in the windows and checking on them and um, contributing how he can by creating shadows and taking them away at optimal times. It's, it's great. So I haven't read past this particular fight, so I don't know how they defeat the Abstract Demon at all. But I do have a prediction, which is that um, I think that the body that we're seeing is made up of the people that the Abstract Demon has eaten. Um, and I don't- and yes, of course, of course everything is made of what they eat, but- but I mean, there's- there's these vague descriptions of all these, like, extra body parts and stuff and um, how things seem to be made of other things. I'm pretty sure Fuhrer is made up of like a bunch of corpses more squished together than particularly digested and then fed back into the rest of the body. Blake goes on this little mental tangent where he thinks about how he doesn't want to have kids because his parents were bad um, and how he didn't particularly have any good role models for parenting. Um, I do have a couple things to say on this. One, one, Blake is still under the impression that he's supposed to be the one to complete the have children component of the requirements that Granny Rose left them. So he's either going to have to find a way out of that or get over that lack of desire. Um, but two, usually people who don't have good parents but want to be good parents make good parents because they're thinking about what not to do and they're thinking about what they wish they would have had now i'm not i'm not saying that people who had terrible childhoods and don't want kids would make good parents but but generally parents who are drawing on their own past experiences are about as effective whether they're drawing from good experiences or bad ones. Blake just hasn't gotten over his baggage with his family, is really what this boils down to. It's okay for Blake to not want to have kids, and he could end it there, but he's blaming it on his family. But eventually Blake and Rose decide to give up on this, even though, even though Rose is able to come up with a pretty good plan, like an actually quite good plan, um, it doesn't change the fact that they're grossly underprepared and they've lost most of their resources. So they decide to skedaddle, and the party collapses outside and pretty much lays on the ground for the next couple of chapters. So then we move into 5.x. So 5.x follows the story of this young man named Joseph in what appears to be the early 1900s. And at the beginning of the chapter, he's walking down the street with his familiar, and they're talking about this mission that he would like to go on. Um, and the conversation with the familiar is really interesting, and it tells us a lot right off the bat. Um, the first thing that we find out is that, so we find out that Joseph chose his familiar completely by logic. We don't even find out the familiar's name, but they don't seem to have a very good relationship. They don't have the kind of chemistry that Blake and Evan have, where they finish each other's sentences and just intuitively understand what the other one means. Um, Joseph and his familiar don't have that, don't have even a tiny sliver of that. In fact, Joseph's familiar seems like he would be in control, like um, Vic and his animal spirit 
if it were that the familiar cared more, but the familiar seems to be fairly distant except in this particular case. They don't seem to really know each other or care about each other, and it almost seems like they're going to go their separate ways after this, except with, you know, maybe some occasional meetings afterwards. So the obvious comparison is with Blake, who chose his, um, who chose his familiar with no thought to logic and in and every thought to emotion. He found a reason why Evan would be a good familiar for him, not the other way around. And from what we see here, it looks like Blake's strategy of going with his gut slash his heart is the correct strategy, in, at least in this situation. Um, the other thing that we learned from this conversation is that Joseph chose his life partner, his familiar, a hundred percent based on this mission to rescue this girl, which which kind of gives us the impression that Joseph cares way too much about the outcome of this mission. No matter how much this mission means, it probably doesn't mean enough to choose your supernatural spouse if it's something that's going to be over this quickly. Interestingly, it appears his familiar retained the ability to lie. And then as they continue to walk down the street, there's just more and more and more and more emphasis on how much this mission means to Joseph and how important this is to him. So they approach the house of the person they're trying to talk to and they meet this dude named Canfield. And um, I 100% was under the impression that this guy was Craster. Like he was... Based on the way Joseph was treating him, I thought he was having sex with his daughters. Like, it did not cross my mind that he wasn't until he explicitly said that he wasn't. But he does seem- but even though he isn't having sex with his daughters, or daughter, um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure if there's more than one. He does seem to get an amount of satisfaction from owning her, um, because he never once says, Courtney doesn't love you. He says, I don't want Courtney to be with you. Um, if, if this was about Courtney's feelings, he would say, go away, my daughter already turned you down. Um, but he doesn't. He talks about how she belongs to him. And uh, he's definitely not great. There's this weird moment where the familiar kills Courtney um, and wears her face. It's completely glossed over uh, because Conquest is able to bring her back, but I, I totally didn't parse that. I, I Maybe I didn't understand. I just didn't. It's bizarre to me that the familiar would kill Courtney if the entire purpose of his familiarization with Joseph was to save her from Canfield. Um, yeah. And, uh... So Joseph makes this promise to Canfield that he will watch him die. And he swears by it. And um, Canfield is able to get back at Joseph by making his body incapable of dying. By, by fusing with conquest. But um, in the moment when you read this, like even if you haven't put together that this is Fel's grandfather, you read the I swear I will watch you bleed. And you go... Oh god, this guy's a dumbass. You know the audience that making promises in this world is really, really stupid because there's all kinds of ways you might not keep them. And, um... Man, I wonder if we know anybody that makes promises and then habitually doesn't keep them. So just, just to be clear, because it took me like a little bit to understand this, the reason why Joseph is indebted to Conquest is because Canfield gave his body to Conquest. So Canfield is Conquest, and Canfield is the person that Joseph made the promise to that was broken. So if Blake were to ever make a promise to someone and then break it, that person is the one who would decide what his penalty is. We see here that Conquest is able to separate familiars. Yikes. Um, we see how badly Forswearing screwed over the entire Atwell family line, and it just goes to show again, like, why would, why would Laird make Duncan swear? It's, 
It, yeah, yeah, it, he would be swearing too layered, but it's it's really it's really just a dick move in general. People should be shying away from promises overall unless they are already enemies. Um, and even in this case, Joseph. So then we see the next couple of Atwells. I really liked Matthew. He seemed like a smart guy, but um unfortunately it just didn't work out for him. Then we switch to Fell. We start Fell's section with seeing um with seeing Blake and Rose with a bunch of goblins, which which was the point when I finally accepted that there were actually goblins and that Blake wasn't just losing it. Just in case you're like me and didn't get it, um, he got the hob he got the goblins from fighting the hyena. Um, he just didn't mention it. We see Fell um, interacting with his niece, who is about to come of age and is starting to get like super super interested in magic, and it says that um, his grandfather's strategy was to just beat the shit out of Matthew and Matthew's strategy was to try to get and Matthew's strategy was to try to get somebody else to sire his children but um Fell's strategy is to just be distant from his niece um which is not a real strategy because she's still, like, super, super interested in magic. She's just not particularly close with her uncle. Um, and it just goes to show you how much hope Fell doesn't really have. Like, he doesn't think that he can contribute much. He doesn't think that he can actually end the Atwell line. He's largely given up on actually getting his family out of this. He does believe that they should be taking Conquest down in any way they can, but... He's... He, his heart isn't in all aspects of it, really. Um, uh, this this whole section just makes the threat of conquest seem so much more real. We've seen Blake and Rose as these small fry practitioners, and Blake has come up with some strategies that he thinks can actually put put some resistance up to conquest. But he doesn't. But I never actually believe that they would make any progress really with any of the ideas that they've had so far I just went okay well they're gonna try some stuff and they're gonna get beat down um this whole section makes you really feel like it's important to beat conquest and that conquest makes everybody's lives miserable it's also revealed that conquest wanted Rose all along not Blake that's really important when we'll get back to it anyway I, I really like Fel he's such a cool guy I um all the all of the character traits we get from him are endearing um like the fact that he always parks in the middle of the road and he never drives less than like 90 miles an hour it's every everything we learn about this man just just makes me think he's super cool it's great so in 6.1 blake is woken up by pris the black guard of the knights of the basement and he describes her as looking kind of like a girl next door um which is not a real description, right? It says that like, he he talks a little bit about the lines on her face, but it occurs to me that Blake describes people largely by the way they make him feel. And the Deep Impact guys did mention that he describes people in terms of age, which is something I didn't notice. But he also he also just describes the impression that you get from interacting with someone. Um, He'll describe what type of person they are and just leave that impression on your mind. Um, but not actually give you any description. Um, for example, when we first met Rose, he said, looks like a female version of me. Which, we didn't know what he looked like at the time. We just knew he was a boy. Uh, we found out he was blonde, like, six chapters later. Um, so... I mean, it's fine. We know who these people are, but it's interesting. So they get in the car with Nick and Pris. Pris is Nick's wife. And, um, and Rose suggests summoning a demon to fight Conquest. So Rose was the first one to suggest summoning a demon to fight somebody. Um, I'm not saying she's wrong. Like, Conquest is a bad bitch, but, uh, it's bad that they're getting into this this early. Thank God one of them has the analyze other people's behavior module because because Rose figures out that Conquest wanted her and not Blake and tells him 
because Blake would never have considered this. Oh. And it becomes really clear in this chapter that, it, it, and it's been pretty clear, but it's it's just emphasized here. But it's it's so good that there are two of them that are trying to work together. They're easily multiplied like 1.5 times intelligence when they're both focused on the same problem. Now, and, and I truly believe that they could not do this, that neither of them could have done this individually. They just, each of them just do not possess the skills to be able to do this by themselves. They have to be covering each other's weak spots. Um, and we'll get back to that later. Uh, Rose goes missing and, R Rose goes missing because she's taken by conquest and uh, Blake immediately says to Nick and Pris, my friend has just been abducted. Um, what's notable about this is it's the first time he's called her his friend with no inner monologue about how he's not sure they're actually friends and is that a lie? Um, I think. I think that's the first time. Um, again, since fighting Conquest, he has liked her better. Unfortunately, uh, that hasn't really changed anything. The knights drop them off at their. The, the knights drop Evan and, and Blake off at his apartment so that he can recharge by uh, being in his apartment, which is almost as good as sleeping. Um, and Blake starts to introduce Evan to the to his life, first by showing him his motorcycle, and Evan thinks that Blake is the coolest dude in the world because he has a motorcycle, and it's adorable and and it's a great scene. And then he walks in and he finds Alexis sitting outside of his door. And he tells Evan to go away. And he starts to talk to her and, um... And he starts to talk to her about what's going on. And he keeps having to deceive her and deceive her. And it's... And it stinks because Alexis is the person that Blake thinks of when he thinks about what he is going to be doing next. Ever since reading Black Lamb's Blood and having that knowledge that he should be trying to do good things. Blake always thinks of things in terms of what would Alexis do? Um, so the fact that he has to deceive her here stinks because it's not what Alexis would do. Alexis would not deceive him under these circumstances. And, um, well, Alexis wouldn't deceive him in general. Under these circumstances, we're not sure. Um, <clears throat> but eventually, he ends up deciding that he really needs extra fuel and currently he's processing it like 1 16th blake but he can recharge the number of blakes that he's at by interacting with people who have connections to blake so he eventually decides that he is going to tell joel and alexis about the magic this absolutely shocked me like i never in a million years would have dreamed that Blake was going to do this. I don't, I appreciate, most of the time in fiction, the person with the secret like never tells the secret and they're always just trying to keep the secret, maybe up until the very end. And I'm not saying that I expected Wildbo to do that because that's a trope. I'm, I'm saying I legitimately didn't think that Blake was going to use his friends in this way. Um, this is something that, as he says, is entirely selfish. Um, it may well have been the right decision, but I didn't expect Blake to make this decision. Um, so, at this point, Blake's team consists of the following. A boy, which is not even the right kind of human to inherit Hill's Glade House, because penis. Um, Rose, who can read. Evan, the lamest familiar that Blake could find. Sorry, buddy. Uh, June, a glorified tape recorder, and five, six, and seven are a bunch of dead goblins that nobody remembers. So the next few, uh, so the next several members of this team are a bunch of normies, some of whom gain the ability to not do any magic. So I've decided that from here on out, I'm going to call Blake's team the Sad Sacks, unless they are able to, uh, unless they come up with a name. So un until I have an actual team name for them, they're the Sad Sacks. 
So 6.2. So Blake starts explaining the whole plot of the story, the sad sex. And they definitely treat him like he's got schizophrenia. And it's a good thing that they have experience with one of their friends actually having schizophrenia because otherwise I, th I think they would have they corrected him. And ultimately, Joel and Goosh decide to remain blackguards for Blake. Uh, Alexis, Tiff, and and then Alexis, Tiff, and Ty decide to awaken. Joseph leaves. You could tell he was going to leave because he has the same name as the narrator of our last interlude, and we can't have that. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the characters who Blake brings into the circle of importance. Um, first off, Ty. Ty is such a ridiculously well-drawn character for someone we've seen so little of. I think I recognize a lot of his character traits more easily because I share a lot of character traits with him, particularly the whole become good at something for like six months and then stop and then do something else thing. I really like Tyler because he's introspective but also a bit of a mess. Usually you think of someone who does a lot of metacognition as being someone who has their life together, but I can say from experience that I don't. Uh, Ty takes himself and his personal growth very seriously, and I like that. When Ty is 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 take is saying what he's saying during the awakening ritual, he seems very aware of his own flaws, but he also seems to have embraced them. He knows himself and he likes himself um, for who he is. I think, I think Ty is super cool. Tiff calls the rose symbolic, pretty, almost useless. Um, this is really interesting because Tiffany is an artist. Symbolic, pretty, almost useless is her job. I mean, she does splatter paint. I don't want to talk bad about splatter paint artists, but she's talking bad about flowers. Why? Her, the stuff that she does isn't exactly life-saving. Um, I would think that she would more appreciate things of beauty that serve no functional purpose. Alexis talks about how she wants to take care of herself, really. Um, we'll have more to say about Alexis at a later time. But I, re I really want Alexis to help Rose. I think we've gotten some foreshadowing that Tiffany is not going to get along with Rose, but Alexis's whole deal is taking on projects of people who are suffering. Um, Rose is in a really bad place, and it doesn't look like Blake is going to be helping her at any time soon, so it would be really neat if Alexis could befriend her. That's just wishful thinking. So now that Blake has made the decision to turn his friends into a bunch of practitioners, I want to talk about why he did it. Uh, so for one, he makes it as a purely emotional impulsive decision, just like he did with Evan, which when compared to Joseph, is demonstrated to be the right way to go. Um, now it turns out later that Isadora tells him this was bad, um, but in general he says that he trusts his instincts and we haven't seen too much that conflicts that so far. It's also a permanent power boost to Blake, who continually loses himself as a person and becomes extra, extra weak. Having these permanent connection power batteries lying around that allow him to remain grounded to himself in the real world definitely is going to help him in the long run. Um, him hanging out with his friends and explaining to them what magic is throughout the rest of this section appears to substitute for sleep as far as becoming more powerful again. Um, and that's something that he desperately needs because he spends most of this book being extremely tired. However, it for one, it pisses off Rose. For two, it was it's demonstrated later by Isadora to have been a bad idea. And three, it puts the people he loves in danger, which is bad. Evan is adorable in this whole section. He um he's the person who greets all the art kids as they exit the awakening ritual. And um, it gives the impression of like the little kid who's been assigned to open the door at a party and welcome everybody. It's adorable. I predict that the art kids are going to be enchanters like the Canfields um, and apparently like the Atwells. Um, Canfields put a huge emphasis on trinkets. 
Um, he used the word trinkets over and over again. And I think that just sounds like something that fits our group, particularly Ty. Um, I don't know if all of them will end up going for the same type of magic. If they do, I would predict they all become enchanters. If, if only, if, if they don't, I predict it will be Ty who goes with enchantment. So Nick of the Knights takes half the party in his car and, um, Alexis sort of chews Blake out for lying to her or lying by omission to her and Evan just defends her defends Blake at her and it's it's very cute and charming but um but while this is happening Blake thinks about whether he should be treating Evan like he's a normal kid whether he should be keeping Evan away from people like Alexis Alexis smokes and she's a tattoo tattoo artist and stuff um and it just sort of reminds you of something, which is that I said a lot last week that Evan will always be an eight-year-old boy. And he, and he will. But it doesn't mean he's not going to grow as a person. He already has a lot more guts than he did two arcs ago. Um, so he is going to be undergoing character development, and he is going to be growing, even if he doesn't grow up. Um, I know the fact that Tiffany was in the other car and learned something different is going to end up being important. I don't know how, uh, but she also didn't see Conquest at all, which is super interesting because if you remember the painting that, that Blake gave to Conquest at the beginning, that was a painting that Tiffany did, and Conquest really super chewed him out for it. So I feel like that's going to be a problem later, but we're keeping that problem in reserve for now so that it can just bite them in the ass at a later time. Ty really, really struggles to not use, like, sarcasm and stuff. Um, he's, he's got a long way to go. Um, he'll probably be super dedicated to magic and stuff and learning specific techniques and runes, but he's still got a long way to go to being an effective practitioner. So Isadora chews out Blake for being a diabolist and just gives him a bunch of shit. And last week I, I didn't talk about why it's not cool that everybody treats Blake terribly for being a diabolist, but I feel like I'm gonna need to cover it, so here we go. Um, in real life, we have nukes. And it would be really cool, perhaps, if we could get rid of all of the nukes that there are and erase everybody's knowledge of how to make one. But we do not have an abstract demon in this world. We have nuclear technology, people have nukes, and we have to deal with that fact. And the way we deal with it is by judging the person who has the nuke. There are certain parties that we're okay with having nukes, and there are certain parties that we go to great lengths to remove their nuclear capability. In the world of Pact, demons exist. In the world of Pact, Diabolists exist. You have to judge diabolists as individuals. And if they are all acting bad, you have to find ways to encourage them to act better, such as Black Lamb's Blood. But it needs to be accepted by the rest of the practitioner community that they need to allow this to happen. Because they're because diabolists aren't just going to go away. You're just you're not going to just not have demons. And it's up to everybody to make the norm of good diabolists a possibility. Isadora is not helping here. Blake threatens to sick a demon on Isadora. So it took him 90 minutes after Rose did. So, great. And finally, Blake blames Isadora for doing nothing to help him, which is entirely fair. Um, if you could have done something and you don't do it, the penalties that come from the lack of your action are your fault. We'll get back to this later. Blake swears that he will make Tiffany swear not to touch diabolism, or the really bad diabolism, um, as soon as he possibly can at his earliest convenience. As of 6.5, he has not done this yet, so... Um, he chews out the shepherd for not taking care of Evan, but this doesn't get resolved, so obviously this will come back up since the shepherd is one of Conquest's champions. 
he is able to spot some patterns in Jeremy's behavior and kind of store that information for later, which is interesting. Um, because it's the first time Blake seems to be actually analyzing someone else's possibility of deceiving him. Um, this is something he's been demonstrably bad at. Um, so it's, it's neat that he is growing in this department. Um, my favorite part of this whole section is, um, is when Blake is talking to the elder sister and he's trying to look tough. You know, you don't need to mess with me or whatever. And, um, and Evan just jumps in and goes, don't worry. Blake's not a threat. He's the nicest person in the whole wide world. Ba ba ba. And um, it's it's great because it just completely undermines any attempts that Blake had at looking tough. So Evan and Blake give the elder sister a verbal smackdown about how they actually put effort into solving a problem and she didn't. And how it makes them better than her. Um, there's that concept of you had the opportunity to do something and you didn't do it. Uh, we're going to get back to that later. Um, Alexis mentions that she's able to scrap when she needs to. Um, I really, really look forward to seeing Alexis in combat. In 6.4, um, we get explicit confirmation that Blake and Rose count as the same person legally. So when Blake promises to do something and then Rose does something that contradicts it in Pose's um, contract, he calls them out on it and he says that no you guys you guys count as one entity if if blake swears to do something rose has to uphold it i am absolutely certain this is going to be important in the future so blake realizing that he can't really defeat conquest any other way decides to draw out the conflict by challenging conquest to a game this came this is a strategy that came up in worm um and that worked out all right. I remember something about like a flesh blob and a freezer. This is gonna go really bad. Um, however, this chapter is hype as shit. Like everything that happens in this chapter just gets your blood pumping and you're like, yeah, I wanna, I can't wait to see where this is going. Um, Wild Bow, occasionally writes these chapters that just make you super, super excited for what's coming. And I, and most of it comes from the team selection, really. Blake choosing who he is going to have on his team. And I think a significant part of this is the way that Wildbow introduces characters, is that Wildbow puts a character's interlude before their plot importance in the story so that you can learn about a character and care about them and then bring them together with another character that you already care about so you're super excited about seeing these two characters that you'd like interact if you didn't know somebody and then they were just introduced as blake's new teammate you would go okay i guess blake has a new teammate um for example fell being the most recent interlude was obviously set up for him being on Blake's team in this arc. So for his five champions, Blake chooses Rose, Fel, Poos, the Hyena, and Maggie. Um, two of which are just hype machines. They're, they're picks intended to make you go, I can't wait to read this. Um, they leave and we get the second beat of Blake holding Rose's hand as she evaporates. Um, but it's slower this time. Uh, she is able to stay in the material world just a little bit longer. There's definitely going to be a third beat here. And I really hope it's something like they walk out of Conquest's realm hand in hand and she doesn't disappear. But I don't really think that's what's going to happen. I just... I just want to point out what a horrible dynamic Blake and Rose have. They're always like, oh, I'll let this slide, or, um, or she owes me this, or whatever. This is a really terrible dynamic to have for a long-term relationship of any kind. Keeping score is a really bad idea, and, and this appears to be their only method of interaction recently. Um, there's this 
there's this mantra that I always read this like marriage advice that says a good relationship is 60-40 effort with both partners trying to be the person giving 60%. Um, both Blake and Rose feel like they're the partner giving 60% and they're waiting for the other one to catch up. It's, it's really toxic. However, Blake has the presence of mind to say that he really hopes him and Rose can get back to being a team, otherwise they're gonna die. And he's right. I, I think, I think part of this is neither of them have a particular expectation for what their relationship should be, and they haven't talked about it, um, and they're not striving for anything in particular. Blake expects this to be a team, but he doesn't really have any experience being on a team, and Rose just knows that she wants their relationship to be not like this, um, and that's not really a great way to improve. <sighs> yeah. 6.5 opens with Blake asking Phil if he can borrow his phone, and Phil is like, what do you mean you don't have a phone? And I would have totally believed that Blake didn't have a phone if it weren't for the fact that they've already had this conversation. This is mind-bending. Blake observes that, Ro that the connection between him and Rose is strong, but jumping around a lot. Um, w with hindsight in play, I think that this is because she feels angry with him, but she also feels guilty. And I also think that there's something else screwing up their connection. Um, something external to both of their individual personalities, whether it was intrinsic to them in advance or left over by conquest um, or something else. So they have a group meeting where they talk about why each of them was selected and what their roles are going to be from this point out. And I should qualify this with Blake told Conquest that this would be a game of who the better leader is. So what's important here is Blake's leadership abilities. Um, and Rose kind of comes as his number two by default. Uh, so, so any leadership failures on her part are really, really bad. Um, so right at the beginning of this meeting, Rose's page starts showing. Remember how I said that page, when she reached her breaking point, she started lashing out and not being interested in finding solutions and just yelling? Uh, that's where we are with Rose. Um, now that doesn't excuse what she's doing here, but I'm just pointing out that that's a pattern. So as previously stated, Rose kind of comes as the number two, or has the potential to be the number two, to Blake in this leadership competition, especially because she was his first pick. Um, so her upsetting the party and yelling about how Blake is a bad leader and trying to, to drive a wedge between him and Evan is really, really, really shitty because Here's some management 102 for you. You never show, if you are in a leadership position and you have a group of leaders and there's a problem between the leaders, you never show your underlings this. You want your underlings to have the best possible environment for them to do their jobs. And if there's nothing they can do about the leadership's problems, they need to not know about it. If you want to have an effective team, the leadership needs to solve their own problems and then help the underlings solve their problems. The underlings do not need to know about the leadership problems. If there's nothing that they can do about it, you're just going to make them worried and miserable. Um, what you need to do is solve the problem. What, what Rose is doing here by sabotaging everybody's faith in Blake is making the team less effective overall. And that's really bad. But also, like I said, this is a leadership challenge. I'm not sure how well Blake is going to do with this because the only leadership he's done has really been with with Rose and Evan. 
and he has a handicap with Evan because Evan thinks that he's the coolest person on the planet. Um, and he, I don't think he's done super well overall. So I hope he can pull it together. Although I will say that Rose doesn't, at this point, believe that there is a solution to the problem that I'm saying that she needs to solve. Um, so now I want to talk about the fight, DM. So Blake pulls Rose aside later and talks to her, and she rails on him. She tells him that he never puts any effort into paying her back when he does her wrong, even though he tries to pay everybody else back, and um, and that he has let her down time and time again, and he leaves her out of things, and, and she's not wrong in any of her points particularly, but she is really kind of a bitch about it. And she eventually admits that she was coerced by um, Conquest to give a bunch of personal information about Blake, which is which is not particularly her fault. In fact, we've we've beat the no one can resist Conquest making them do something drum about a million times, and Blake has been acting under the assumption that Rose wouldn't be able to resist Conquest asking her to do anything for this for the last couple of arcs, but she does behave really bitchy here. So I'm, I know that I'm going to have to take a side effectively. I'm being asked to take a side and you guys probably want to know what side I'm taking. So I want you to think of a hypothetical so that you understand where I'm coming from when I make the decision that I make about which, which of the twins side I'm on. Um, <clears throat> Let's imagine that you are a young person and your parents give you a car. So you didn't do any research into this car. You don't know anything about the car when it's given to you. Um, it's definitely an asset once you have it, but if you want to know anything about it, you're going to have to look it up or look in the manual. And then the car starts having problems. The car starts making noises and sometimes the lights come on on the dashboard telling you you need to go take it to a dealer. And you say that you're going to deal with this at some point, but you keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. You get more and more dashboard lights begging you to take it in for maintenance, but you never take it into the shop. It's not a priority. You have other things you need to be doing, and they are important. And then one day, you need to go somewhere important, and the car breaks down. Is it a shit car, or are you a shit car owner? Now this story comes from personal experience. My first car, I never took care of, and I never vacuumed it, and I didn't take it in after it had the maintenance light on for five years. And then when I traded it in, they said, wow, you didn't take care of this car. We're going to give you $200 for it. And it was my baby. It was my fault that I didn't take care of my car, despite the fact that it made noises and it gave me one time every single light at the same time. And eventually when it died, it was because I didn't help it when it asked. Blake has spent this entire book thinking repeatedly, wow, Rose looks like she's doing really bad. Wow, Rose seems really sad or angry, or I'm gonna do this thing for Rose. And he always promises that he's going to, and he never follows through. She has even a couple of times come to him and told him, hey, I feel really bad about the relationship between you and I, and I don't know what we can do about it. And he's never actually put any effort into repairing it. There have been a couple of times that he did some one-off things like buying the bike mirrors, but overall, he hasn't been a great friend. And he certainly hasn't put as much effort into his friendship with her as he has with other characters in the story who are less prominent. Like I said, I absolutely blame Rose for the outburst that she had here, but it doesn't change the fact that Rose asked Blake for help several times and he ignored it. Oh. Everyone is absolutely responsible for their own actions, but only to a point. If a person relies on you and they are not getting what they need, it's your fault. Rose relies completely on Blake for all of her resources particularly emotionally, because she can't get, she can't interact with anyone else. She can 
She's spoken like 15 lines to Evan because they just met. All of her emotional fulfillment has to come from Blake. Otherwise, she's just reading and being tortured by conquest. Emotionally, her resources have run completely dry. Blake has gotten to go home. Blake has gotten to sleep. Rose has been awake for the last 10 days, minus being in a coma while she was hanging out with Conquest for one of them. So I initially interpreted their relationship through what I thought Blake saw her as, which, which he did, which was, which was a symbol of his interactions with his family. Um, he saw her as what his life could have been like if his family had been kind to him and if he had interacted with his family differently. But, and, and that has certainly colored their interactions, but it's been less and less, and I think it's finally time to put it to rest now. At the beginning, he was, she was something that represented something painful to him, and he was someone who could be interesting to her. But now that six arcs have passed, um, they're genuinely people to each other. And to Blake, Rose is a useful tool, and to Rose, he's a person who has treated her poorly and let her down over and over. Rose has demonstrated being genuinely interested in Blake's life, tattoos, and friends, and he hasn't returned that at all. Um, I do think that the initial problems in their relationship were his fault. Even though his problems with her came from an innocent place, he didn't... This spiraled out of control because of his actions. And I'm not sure what she could have done to prevent things from spiraling out of control more up to this point, other than shrink herself down more. The real question of her character is what she does now. Um, so I said that Rose is acting more like Paige now, um, but Rose has been dealing with nonstop shit the whole time. Um, she's definitely able to handle much more stress than Paige is. Paige broke after a single phone call from the police, and Rose has handled this whole book up to this point. Um, but it looks like her limit just isn't as far away from zero as Blake's is. But also, Blake has friends, and a familiar, and he can sleep. So, in conclusion, Rose is acting incredibly shitty, but I have to put the fault on Blake at this point. Um, Additionally, I am, I do have like a 30% suspicion that something else is acting on this right now. Um, at first I was 100% convinced, but the more I thought about what their relationship has been, has become in recent chapters, the more convinced I was that, no, this is just what this has been leading up to. And, but I still have more to say about this conversation. So for one, Conquest already knew how to push Blake's buttons. He knew that Blake didn't like to be touched and didn't like to be handled. Um, he made Rose tell him so that it would drive a wedge between the two of them. Rose says that she thinks they could be meant to be enemies, um, but I don't think that could possibly have been Rose Sr.'s plan. We've seen time and time again that they are much more intelligent when they work together. It is possible that Rose Sr. was always planning for only one of them to survive, but I really don't think framing them as enemies specifically would be part of her plan. If they are, if they do become enemies, it's a problem intrinsic to the Blos psychology. Um, again, I mentioned last week that I don't think Blake could have a familiar who is an equal to him. Um, and I think whatever causes that is intrinsic to Rose as well. Finally, Blake says that he thinks Rose betraying him by telling things by by telling Conquest about him makes things more even, but I think this is just a way for him to excuse himself. He thinks of it as even in terms of the spirits and karma and stuff, but that's that's not what matters. Um, the stakes aren't karma. The stakes are his most important ally turning into an enemy. Um, Blake isn't looking to the future or examining their relationship in any way. He doesn't think about the implications of not having Rose on his side, despite the fact that every moment he, she's gone, he's wondering when she'll come back. It's not a good headspace, particularly since, as we found out, that they count legally as a single person. 
if one of them, if it gets to the point where one of them tries to harm the other, they are both fucked. Unfortunately, I, I don't think this is going to be over anytime soon. One of Wildbow's trademarks, one I don't particularly enjoy, but one that he does a damn good job at, is making the relationship between two people be believably strained. His works are full of these painful, stretched out conflicts that are never fully resolved. Finally, I think, I, I thought about it for a while and I think the way that Rose could have actually pushed back against Blake and made progress is to give him specific things that she wanted. She always said, I want things to be better. Um, but she never actually said, Blake, I need you to find me a goblin to order around. Now, I do think that when Blake found those goblins, he probably did it for Rose. Um, the goblins that he doesn't remember binding with the hyena. But she doesn't remember it either. So he's going to have to do something like that again. But at this point, it's too little too late. Blake will have to change his behavior overall, not just find something pretty that he can give to her. And now finally, we're out of that section. Um, I just have a couple more points. One, um, entertainingly, uh, Fel destroys one of Blake's chairs. It's a, just a cheap Ikea chair, but Blake is like, you know what? It's fine because it's just the spirit realm version of my chair. Um, and then later Fel reveals that no, anything that happens in the apartment happens in the real apartment. Um, so Fel just casually destroyed part of Blake's apartment because he's just being shit. I love Fel. And then finally Evan rides around in Blake's jacket when they're, when, when Blake is going for a motorcycle ride. And it's adorable because Evan thinks that this is the greatest thing that has ever happened to him. But, um, again, Evan has a physical closeness to Blake that nobody else does. Um, yes, it, Evan is not a person, but it is progress that he is able to be close to a sentient thing, um, and not freak out. He has difficulty holding Rose's hand, and it's just a hand. So what was I inspired by this week? This one's a really lame one, honestly, but I wanted to throw it in there because it's something that I personally relate to and have an issue with. Um, so I'm the kind of person that like, I have to get up at the same time every day. I drink my coffee. And if I, if I get less than seven and a half hours of sleep, I'm useless. If I don't drink my coffee, I'm useless. I have to, I have to eat like the right diet. If I start eating like poorly, then my pr productivity goes down and I don't do as well at my job and stuff. And reading about this kind of makes me feel like I'm a whiner. Blake hasn't slept in 10 chapters as of 6.5, um, which is a full 24 hours. Um, but he's also fought like a bunch of people and he's still making plans and he's still getting one over on conquest and leading a team. He is able to substitute some sleep by hanging out with his friends, which is just not fair. Um, but it kind of shows you... Remember how I said that I'm really inspired by One Punch Man? Because it asks me every time I watch it why I'm not doing more push-ups. This is kind of the same deal. Seeing Blake keep going and going and going and pushing and pushing, even when he's exhausted, really makes me think that I need to be doing better. But not in a condescending way. So yeah, that's chapters 5.5 through 6.5 of Pact by Wildbow. See you at the next one.